When we think of angels, the images conjured are often quite similar radiant winged figures that have many human traits. But not all angels have human shapes. There are extremely shocking truths that the Bible revealed to us about the real angels. Angels can be creatures who are humans with four animal faces or giant wheels covered with eyes all around. Before I reveal more about the secret of the true appearance of angels in the Bible, please subscribe to my channel Timeless Bible Tales and turn on the notification bell next to it so you don't miss any of my latest videos. In the Bible, most angels appear in the human world with the same appearance as us. We can mention some outstanding cases, such as the Archangel Gabriel announcing to Maria that she would be pregnant with the Son of God. Matthew 1, 18, 25, Luke 1, 26, 56, where the Apostle Peter was miraculously rescued from Herod the Great's prison by an angel right before his trial. This story is described very clearly in Acts of the Apostles 12. While Peter was being tied up in chains, an angel appeared, removed all the chains from his body, and led him safely out of the city. There are many other stories about angels described in the Bible. Although not all of them depict angels as human-like, many of us still believe that all of God's angels are human-like in appearance. The fact that angels appear in human form in classic arts or movies makes lots of people think that it is the true form of angels. Meanwhile, angels in the Bible are described completely differently from the images we often see. In the 12th century, scholars divided the angels around God into categories based on a hierarchical system. In Christianity, this is referred to as the three spheres and the nine orders of angels because it describes a three-tier system with three types of angels in each tier, the seraphim. First, we have seraphim. The seraphim is a type of angel that appears in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Tradition places seraphim in the highest rank in the hierarchy of angels and the fifth rank of ten in the Jewish angelic hierarchy. A seminal passage in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 6.1.8, used the term to describe six winged beings that fly around the throne of God crying, Holy, 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 Holy. This throne scene, with its triple invocation of holiness, profoundly influenced subsequent theology, literature, and art. Its influence is frequently seen in works depicting angels, heaven, and apotheosis. Seraphim are mentioned as celestial beings in the non-canonical book of Enoch and the canonical book of Revelation. In Hebrew, the word seraph means burning and is used seven times throughout the text of the Hebrew Bible as a noun. It is used twice in the book of Numbers, once in the book of Deuteronomy, and four times in the book of Isaiah. 626, 1429, 36. The reason the word for burning was also used to denote a serpent is not universally agreed upon. It may be due to a certain snake's fiery colors or perhaps the burning sensation left by its venomous bite. Regardless, its plural form, seraphim, occurs in both Numbers and Isaiah, but only in Isaiah is it used to denote an angelic being likewise. These angels are referred to only as the plural seraphim Isaiah later uses the singular seraph to describe a fiery flying serpent, in line with the other uses of the term throughout the Tanakh. It is also sometimes called a love object because the name may have originated from the Hebrew word for love. Seraphim is fully described in the Bible in the prophet Isaiah, when he was called by God and had a vision Isaiah 6:17. The word seraphim is mentioned only once in the Bible, specifically in the book of Isaiah. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Isaiah 6:2. From this passage we can gather that two of these six wings were used to cover their faces, two to cover their feet, and the last two they used to fly. The wings were used to cover their faces because they were close to God, seeing His full glory, the strong light that was hard to bear. Feet are considered unclean and unworthy of being exposed before God. The second passage describes them almost as cheerleaders who fly around the throne of God spreading the word of His glory. This description is not as detailed as the cherubim, so all we know for sure is that the seraphim were made up mostly of wings. The book of Revelation only differs slightly, describing their six wings as being full of eyes. In Islam, the term seraph is used to describe certain archangels who are born from celestial fire. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologia offers a description of the nature of seraphim. The name seraphim does not come from charity only, but from the excess of charity expressed by the word ardor or fire. Hence Dionysus Kowal, higher. VA expounds the name seraphim according to the properties of fire, containing an excess of heat. Now in fire, we may consider three things. First, the movement is upward and continuous. This signifies that they are born inflexibly towards God. Secondly, the active force, which is heat. 
which is not found in fire simply, but exists with a certain sharpness, as being of most penetrating action, and reaching even to the smallest things, and as it were, with superabundant fervor, whereby is signified the action of these angels, exercised powerfully upon those who are subject to them, rousing them to a like fervor, and cleansing them wholly by their heat. Thirdly, we consider in fire the quality of clarity, or brightness which signifies that these angels have in themselves an inextinguishable light, and that they also perfectly enlighten others. The Book of Revelation also mentions six winged creatures praising God day and night. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is, and is to come Revelation 448. The description in the book of Revelation differs slightly from Isaiah's when it describes six winged angels with eyes all around. In art, seraphim are often depicted in red because seraphim means burning thing and illustrated holding a flaming sword with the words holy, 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 holy. You can find many depictions of seraphim on the internet, and most of them look quite horror. Most of them are based on the Bible, with signature signs such as six wings and eyes around. There are two quite popular versions of seraphim. One is an angel in human form with six wings. This is probably a less horrifying version and closer to us, a version that closely matches Isaiah's description. Another version of Seraphim is a giant angel with only wings. They do not have bodies like humans, but they only have six giant wings. At the intersection of those wings is a human face, or maybe just a huge eye that moves continuously. Those wings may simply be feathers, but some other versions describe the Seraphim's wings as covered with numerous large and small eyes. The bloodshot eyes continuously move, giving us a feeling of unspeakable horror. If it weren't for the captions that said they were seraphim angels, we might have thought they were aliens when we first saw them. The cherubim or cherubs. Next we will have the cherubim or cherubs. Near the bottom of this hierarchy are the cherubim. In the Jewish angelic hierarchy, cherubim has the ninth second lowest rank in Maimonides Mishni Torah 12th century, and the third rank in Kabbalistic works such as Barat Minucha 14th century. The Christian work De Coalesti Hierarchia places them in the highest rank alongside seraphim and thrones. People often think that Cherubim Kerubim has the appearance of a dazed, cute baby with two small wings. However, the Bible does not describe it like that. Cherubim are described in two books of the Bible Genesis and Ezekiel. Cherubim first appears in Genesis 3.22-24. They are described as angels wielding a blazing fire sword and are tasked by God with guarding the tree of life. In the book of Ezekiel and at least some Christian iconography, the cherub is depicted as a living creature, whose form is human, but it has four wings and four faces the face of a lion representative of all wild animals, on the right side, an ox domestic animal on the left face. The face of the human being human and face of an eagle bird. Their legs are straight, and the soles of their feet are like ox hoofs, shiny like polished brass. They each had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering its body. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. Ezekiel 1, 5 to 10. The cherubim are also described by Ezekiel as fiery beings, which is quite similar to the description of the seraphim. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire, or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures it was bright, and lightning flashed out of it, Ezekiel 1:13. Later tradition assigned them many external appearances. Some early medieval literature considered them immaterial. In the Western Christian tradition, cherubim is associated with Puto derived from classical Cupid arrows, leading to depictions of cherubim as small, plump, winged boys. Aside from Ezekiel's vision, no detailed attestations of cherubim survive, and Ezekiel's description of the tetramorph being may be different from the cherubim of the historic Israelites. Ezekiel describes them as having four faces, each one representing something different. The lion represented wild animals, the ox represented domesticated animals, the eagle represented birds, 
and the human represented humanity. The cherubim had long straight legs with hooves and two pairs of wings. You may also see them with regular feet and four pairs of wings. This is a much different appearance from the young plump cherubs we would associate with figures like Cupid, which stem from Christian scholars such as Thomas Aquinas, who characterized them as having a burning love for God. The Hebrew Bible mentions the word cherubim almost 100 times, but their purpose is still fairly ambiguous. The general belief is that they exist to guard the Garden of Eden, especially the Tree of Life. The cherubim having numerous faces has this almost chimera feel, but the human face is something more akin to a sphinx. The appearance of the cherubim continues to be a subject of debate. Mythological hybrids are common in the art of the ancient Near East. One example is the Babylonian Lamassu or Shedu, a protective spirit with a sphinx-like form, possessing the wings of an eagle, the body of a lion, and the head of a king. This was adopted largely in Phoenicia. The wings, because of their artistic beauty, soon became the most prominent part, and animals of various kinds were adorned with wings consequently. Wings were bestowed also upon man, thus forming the stereotypical image of an angel. The Egyptian decans were known to take different forms depending on their duties and their position in the sky. In particular resonance with the idea of cherubim embodying the throne of God, numerous pieces of art from Phoenicia, Egypt, and even Tel Megiddo in northern Israel depict kings, or deities being carried on their thrones by hybrid winged creatures. If this largely animal issue appearance is how the ancient Israelites envisioned cherubim, it raises more questions than it answers. For one, it is difficult to visualize the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant as quadrupedal creatures with backward-facing wings. These cherubim were meant to face each other and have their wings meet while remaining on the edges of the cover, where they were beaten. At the same time, these creatures have little to resemblance to the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision. On the other hand, even if cherubim had a more humanoid form, this still would not entirely match Ezekiel's vision. Likewise, seemingly clashes with the equivalent archetypes of the cultures surrounding the Israelites, which almost uniformly depicted beings that served analogous purposes to Israel's cherubim as largely animalistic. All of this may indicate that the Israelite idea of what a cherub looked like was subject to change, and perhaps not wholly consistent. Later tradition ascribes to them a variety of physical appearances. Some early Midrash literature conceives of them as non-corporeal. In Western Christian tradition, cherubim has become associated with the puto derived from Cupid in classical antiquity, resulting in depictions of cherubim as small, plump, winged boys. The Ophanim or the Thrones. Next we have the Thrones or the Ophanim. Pseudo-Dionysus the Areopagite lists the thrones as the third highest of nine levels of angels. Thrones are sometimes equated with Ophanim since the throne of God is usually depicted as being moved by wheels, as in the vision of Daniel 7 9 Old Testament. Rosemary Ellen Guiley 1996 p. 37 states that. The thrones also known as Ophanim Ophanim and Galgalim are creatures that function as the actual chariots of God driven by the cherubs. They are characterized by peace and submission God rests upon them. Thrones are depicted as great wheels containing many eyes and reside in the area of the cosmos where material form begins to take shape. They chant glorious to God and remain forever in His presence. They mete out divine justice and maintain the cosmic harmony of all universal laws. The angels of the Thrones choir are generally described as great wheels, covered in eyes that deliver divine justice and hold up God, remaining forever in His presence. The Ophanim are very closely associated with the cherubim. They are often depicted together, for example, in Ezekiel's vision as I looked at the living creatures. I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces when the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground. The wheels also rose Ezekiel 1:15, 19. In Ezekiel, the Ophanim are depicted as two wheels covered with eyes and nested together. As I looked at the living creatures' cherubim, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels they sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel, as they moved. They would go in any of the four directions the creatures faced the wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four were full of eyes. Ezekiel 1 15, 18. As Ezekiel described him, the thrones or wheels appeared as four wheels within wheels that were constantly spinning. The wheels had four wings on them, two to fly and two to cover part of itself. When describing these wheels, he says that their height was such that it was pretty dreadful. 
He also talks about the parts of them beneath the sky. So these things may be as big as the sky. These are about as far from a traditional looking angel as one can get. In Christianity, the Elphinom were entities that acted as chariots or transportation for the cherubim. They were giant interlocking wheels with wings and eyes that would reside in the part of the cosmos where material form began to shape. Like the seraphim, they also chant God's glory whenever in his presence. In Hebrew, Ophanim refers to wheels or spheres. The Book of Enoch describes them as the many-eyed ones and places them in the same category of celestial beings as cherubim and seraphim. Their role here was much more than transportation. The Ophanim never slept and forever guarded the throne of God. When Ezekiel has his vision of the great chariot, he describes all three of these angels as the guardians. Some believe this was a hallucination, while others take Ezekiel's account as an encounter with UFOs. So no one knows where they came from and why they look so strange. In Ezekiel, the creatures all have a light covering the top of their heads, and they make a roar every time they move. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and awesome. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out one toward the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings, Ezekiel 1 24. These descriptions create an extremely mystical feeling, as well as demonstrate the immense power and strength of the gods. Magnanimity and power pervade the entire sentence, setting the stage for the majestic and powerful appearance of God immediately following. Why are God's most powerful angels depicted as having eyes covering their entire body? In my opinion, angels are God's assistants. They perform great tasks, such as protecting God or managing the world with Him. God is the powerful being who governs everything, but what humans have known, such as the earth or the universe, is extremely large, and it is extremely difficult for God to manage all of his creations. Therefore, he sent angels to help him observe the world and report to him what was happening. Eyes represent vision and observation, and angels are given countless eyes so they can see everything in this world. They must report to God what they see, helping him manage the world. Try to imagine angels as guardians, tasked with observing and managing order. Their eyes are like cameras that are always active and observing everything. A few eyes, or we can compare it to a few cameras, is never enough for us to see everything we want to see. The more cameras, or more eyes, make angels see more things and monitor more things. That is also part of the reason God always knows everything that happens in this world. He, through the observations of the angels, he knows the events that are happening. From there, he can adapt to all changes in the world. And accordingly, God always sees and knows all human actions through angels. Nothing was hidden from the countless eyes of the angels, and they reported everything they saw to God. God will remember that information and use it for the final judgment. Do you remember that in the book of Revelation, God will open a book that records the entire life, merits, and sins of all people, and he uses that information to decide who will go to heaven or be thrown into hell. The detail of the angel's eyes reminds us that God is always watching us at all times, in all places. He knows what good things we have done and records all our sins, not missing anything. We need to remember that nothing can escape God's sight and control. His power is absolute. He sees everything in the light, but he sees even what happens in the darkness. He will not do it alone, for the angels will use their countless eyes to help him. On the virtues. The virtues are a group of angels who don't possess a physical body but have control over the elements. They are referred to as the shining ones because they appear as sparks of light. Their main role was to perform miracles for those who were deemed as deserving. They would be given orders from the angels above them and travel to earth to perform these miracles. On earth, they take a human form. There are several types of angels, along with the virtues, whose primary form resembles a light source. Angels are celestial beings. They are neither male nor female and essentially can take whatever form they desire. Is it a surprise that the angels who spend all their time in the cosmos with God are the strangest and most unorthodox looking? No, not really. If you're talking about regions that are supposed to be outside our comprehension, then surely the beings who inhabit them would also look out of place. Even if that does mean they resemble something you expect to see in a Lovecraftian horror, or perhaps the writings of someone coming down off an acid trip. It also makes sense for the archangels and regular angels to be seen in a much more human light, as they have the most human interaction. The further back you delve into various religious texts, 
the stranger angels appear to be. As later books were added and revised, more human angels became the norm. Maybe this was done to make things easier to understand. In reality, we may never know, but it is still interesting to examine. Angels may look incredibly scary, but we shouldn't be afraid of them. Angels are always extremely pure and friendly creatures. God has no set pattern for all of his creations, including angels and humans. We only know that God created humans based on his appearance, but we do not know what he created the angels based on. We only know that God created angels long before humans, and he gave them great powers to serve and worship him. Therefore, people should not judge the appearance of angels because when we judge them, we are also judging and doubting Godding God. God never and does not need to tell us what angels look like. What we need to do is just trust and respect God and everything he created. Physical appearance cannot evaluate the entire qualities of angels. No matter what their appearance is, they are still creatures created by God to serve and worship him. Only holy and pure creatures can be with God, and angels are his purest creatures. When we are blessed and live in heaven, the physical appearance of angels will not be something we have to worry about anymore. The only thing we care about is worshiping God. Whether giant angels or small humans, there will only be God at the center of everything. Angels, in addition to their duty to help God govern the world, God also orders them to always help humans. In the past, the angel helped Daniel survive in the lion's den, freeing Peter from the dungeon. They fought the demons, defeating Satan in the war of heaven. No demon can overcome the angels and God. The Bible clearly shows us the holiness of angels towards humans, and I am sure that many of us have received their protection. As long as you believe in God and the angels, they will always be by your side and protect you from evil demons. The holiness of God and the angels is the sword that helps us destroy demons and sin. Our peaceful life in the present, our eternal life in God's paradise, would be arduous and perhaps incomplete without the protection of God and the angels. Therefore, we should love and trust in angels, just as we love and trust in God. If you are one of those who have the honor of meeting angels, please share with everyone about your experience in the comments section. And don't forget to like and share this video with your friends and family. Your actions, although small, contribute greatly to spreading God's beautiful values more widely. Thanks for watching and God bless you. Amen.